Good morning, everybody. This is the um, Committee on Health and Homelessness. It's Thursday, April 11th, um, 11.15, uh, our 11.15 agenda um, with some resolutions. We're in conference room 329 and on Zoom. Um, really quickly, um, housekeeping for our members on Zoom, please stay muted until ready, asked to speak. Um, if we do have any kind of technical difficulties where we cannot get you back online, we will um, end the hearing and re-notice. Uh, first, so we have members, we have four resolutions um, that we're going to be getting through really quickly here today. The first one up is SCR 23, SD1, urging the Department of Health to amend the Hawaii administrative rules to authorize licensed dietitians to prescribe modified diets and planned therapeutic diets. Uh, first up, we have Department of Health. Good morning, Vice Chair, Chair, members of the committee, Lauren Kim for DOH. Uh, the department will stand on its testimony, offering comments and uh, we are open to uh, amendments as proposed. Thank you. Next up, we have the Hawaii Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in support. We have in, uh, testimony from two individuals in support and late testimony from Nutrition Unlimited in support. Is there anybody else in the room wishing to testify? Aloha, Angela Melody Young testifying on behalf of CARES. So um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, the federal um, office says that dietitians and nutritionists counsel patients on nutrition issues and healthy eating habits. Dietitian and nutritionists are experts in food and nutrition to promote health and manage illness to prevent sickness. They plan and conduct food service or nutritional programs to help people lead healthy lives. A regular nutritionist cannot provide medical nutritional counseling or diagnose or treat illnesses. And in contrast, a registered dietitian is credentialed and can provide medical nutritional therapy and counseling. For example, a registered dietitian may provide nutrition-based treatments to diabetic patients or develop nutrition plans in a clinically approved setting. And registered dietitians can also develop nutrition plans for uh, athletes and players of sports. So also research from the Healthcare Made Practical, a multi-channel leader in healthcare events and education with a mission in improving patient care and the quality of health access, says that the health industry is improving the quality of care um, by looking for streamlining um, processes and to increase efficiencies with the new rule, a final rule um, from the president's instructions um, from the executive order 13563, urging federal offices to reduce or revise outdated or unnecessarily burdensome rules and regulations. The new rules provide standards of healthcare um, practices to participate in Medicare and Medicaid programs um, to streamline it without jeopardizing health and safety. So this is all just a fancy way of saying the president made a new rule about making healthcare processes more efficient by eliminating barriers. And this uh, resolution is in alignment with that order um, because for patients to receive timely care, um, for nutrition, the registered dietitian must be viewed as an integral part of the hospital interdisciplinary care team. And um, as the team's clinical nutrition expert is responsible for a patient's nutritional diagnosis and treatment in light of the patient's medical diagnosis. And under the new rule, qualified registered dietitians will be able to order patient diets and hospitals will allow ordering of nutrition-related laboratory tests to monitor and modify diet plans without the supervision or approval of a surgeon or a physician or a primary care doctor. So eliminating the barrier, the extra step in the treatment process, the CMS estimates the savings from the new rule is approximately $459 million per year. So in support of the resolution. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Any members on Zoom? Okay. Members, questions? No questions? Uh, moving on to the next resolution, this is SCR 34, requesting the Hawaii Medical Association and Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association to convene a roundtable to establish medical protocols to ensure that an individual's thyroid function is tested before psychotropic medic medications for mental illness are prescribed. Uh, first up, we have uh, Hawaii Disability Rights Center on Zoom. Oh. Okay, I'm trying to... <coughs> Hello, I'm trying... Hi, thank you. Anyway, I was trying to start the video uh, 
We had a good discussion uh, on HCR 144, so I don't think I really need to add anything other than stand on my testimony. And uh, thank you very much for your past support and uh, presumably, hopefully, future support. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we have six individuals all in support. Um, is anyone here in the room um, on the list? Um, actually, Ms. Pauline Arellano. Uh, I support Senate Concurrent Resolution 34 regarding thyroid testing, uh, thyroid testing. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I belong to many fine organizations. My thoughts and opinions are my own. Hyper and hypothyroidism mimics exactly the symptoms and behavior of bipolar illness. The good news is it has been 16 years since our last psychiatric hospitalization. Prior to this time, it had been once a year, sometimes twice. We had her admitted to Kahi for violent behavior. They isolated her, put her in four-point restraints, and there are a few things that are more horrible than to see your loved one restrained like a wild animal. They couldn't bring her down. They gave her enough meds to put a horse to sleep. Finally, zombie. Six months later, Castle, new doctor, new meds, lithium and Prozac. Eight days later, she is a vegetable, no movement at all for eight months. The doctor dropped us as a patient. No psychiatrist on this island would take us. We ended up in the state system, the Wahiwa Clinic. Dr. Douglas Cooper walked up to her, touched her face and hair, and said, I don't agree with her diagnosis. She has a thyroid condition. Months of physical therapy and weaning her off the lithium, which while good for some psychiatric disorders is the worst medicine for a thyroid condition. With the new diagnosis and change in meds, we were able to get her out of this vegetative state she can now walk, talk, and feed, and dress herself. Recently, odd behavior, the thyroid spiked, the medicine was adjusted, 10 hours later, normal. I am asking the legislature to approve SCR 34 regarding thyroid testing before psychotropic medicines are administered. Clinical labs test, test $58. Less than one hour after a blood draw, results will be able to confirm if there is a thyroid issue. Doctors once took an oath, first do no harm. Horrendous harm can be done with a misdiagnosis. You have this power. Please don't let this ever happen again. Thank you. I am a mama on a mission and my name is Pauline Arellano. Thank you. Um, those are all the people who test, uh, submitted testimony. Um, anybody else in the room wishing to testify? Um, actually. Honorable Chair Bilotti and Acting Chair Takanucci and HLT committee members. I'm Dr. Joe Ritter testifying in support. This bill is personal to myself and our family. Since youth, Representative Amato's daughter Gabby had virtually non-functioning thyroid. Last month, after moving, uh, while waiting for new health care to kick in, Gabby, who's not normally in need of any mental health care uh, or psychotropics, was hospitalized with a preventable temporary hypothyroid psycho psychosis, the topic of this resolution. Initially, she requested her new provider provide, perform a thyroid test as she felt ill. They could not schedule it. Then she went to the hospital and treatment was refused. Then she developed serious symptoms and spent days in an emergency unit and they had no idea how to treat her. We finally worked out HIPAA and communicated with her and her physicians and for several days she suffered greatly. Fortunately, after days of suffering, I was able to speak with her physicians and instruct them on testing and let them know the primary cause. She's now fine. Testing recommended in this resolution would have prevented her suffering and also the use of expensive medical resources. She could have been severely hurt or died understand that physicians do not want others meddling in their standard practices. 
Uh, every sibling of, in my family is a doctor. My brother is an ER doctor and a palliative care doctor, and we have a, a reconstructive surgeon. So I do understand that lawmakers need to listen to medical organizations and experts on bills. But here is a specific case where someone was hospitalized in an emergency twice, and proper care took days to start simply because simple thyroid tests weren't performed. This resolution will save lives, save a lot of money in health care, and simply a reminder that this standard of care is necessary. Please prevent protect victims that cannot protect themselves. Consider naming this Gabby's resolution. This is personal in our family. Thank you for your time listening to this testimony and support. Thank you. Any other members in the room wishing to testify? Angela Melody Young, testifying on behalf of CARES in strong support. Um, so, this resolution um, is to test for thyroid function before administering psychotropic medicine for um, mental illness. So I'm going to read the research um, from CDC. Um, so psychiatric, psychoactive, psychotropic medications are medicines such as antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, stimulants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers. Antidepressants treat depression. I'm and so sorry, could, could you summarize? Um, we, we didn't need to get to session by, oh. by noon, and there's a couple of more resolutions okay. on the agenda. So prior to being prescribed <sighs> such medicines, a patient should get checked for thyroid function, right? Otherwise, adverse effects will occur. And evaluating for thyroid disease um, should be integrated into um, this health process. And... Um, there are two standard blood tests for thyroid function. Um, and then also um, there can be a thyroid ultrasound as a diagnostic test. Um, so these um, series of thyroid tests to be performed prior to prescribing for mental illness um, should help to improve efficacy and to minimize harm. Thank you. Any other members on Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, uh, moving on. Oh, members, any questions? Okay. Seeing none, moving on to the next resolution. This is SCR 64, urging the state and counties to prioritize and direct all available resources to supporting coordinated interagency collaboration and public-private partnerships aimed at addressing the ongoing fentanyl epidemic. Um, first, we have Department of Health in support. We also have uh, Micah Alameda. Aloha, Vice Chair Takano Uchi. Aloha, Chair Bilati. Aloha, Rep Amato. We, my name is Mike Alameda with the Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force. We stand in strong support on our written testimony, on our late testimony, Kalamai. It's been a busy week in Hilo, but we're catching up. However, we mahalo you for hearing this measure. It's very important to us. We respectfully request one minor amendment on page one, line 16. There's a reference to oxytocin. We're, we're requesting for that to be changed to oxycodone or oxycotton. Oxytocin is a prescription generally used during childbirth, and there's hardly any data that suggests that individuals are abusing that here. Uh, but oxycodone and oxycotton, they definitely are. So if, I would leave that up to you folks uh, to determine which, which you'd like to use, oxycotton or oxycodone. But that's the only amendment that we're requesting. Mahalo so much. We appreciate and we stand in strong support of this measure. Thank you. Um, that's all the testimony we've received on this measure. Anybody else wishing to testify in the room? Aloha, Angela Melody Young testifying on behalf of CARES in strong support. Um, and so the opiate crisis, um, it really requires a multi-jurisdictional interagency collaboration. Um, so from the Federal Office of the CDC in 2022, it released an emergency declaration that a renewal of determination that a public health emergency exists. And as a result of the continued consequences of the opiate crisis affecting our nation, on this date and after consultation with public health officials as necessary, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, pursuant to the authority vested within the section 319 of the Public Health Service Act, renewed the October 27th 
2018 determination by former acting secretary that an uh, opiate public health emergency indeed exists. Um, and so there were uh, drug overdose deaths and um, in the years from 1999 to 2015, um, the opiate overdose deaths have quadrupled four times. Um, and uh, by the end of 2015, more than half a million people have died. So, um, you know, opiate overdose involves a nonprofit sector, social work sector, health departments, state department um, of the emergency um, services from the city also, and the county police, the attorney general, the prosecuting attorney, um, doctors, distributors, and pharmacies, experts from the health policy, law enforcement, and social work sector. Um, I think they can provide a more authentic picture when examining um, the opiate crisis. Yeah, so um, also you can consider working with the city council because um, they just enacted the Bill 28 about opiate antagonists um, to reverse the effects of opiate o overdose. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify in the room or on Zoom? Seeing none, members, any questions? Seeing none, moving on to our final resolution. Final resolution, SCR 81 SD1, urging the Gov urging the governor to ensure that the relevant relevant state agencies, including the Department of Health and Department of Human Services collaborate to explore avenues to ensure continued access to affordable medications for the state's underserved populations under the 340B drug pricing program and urging Hawaii's congressional delegation and relevant federal agencies to monitor pharmaceutical companies and take appropriate actions to protect the program integrity of the 340B drug pricing program. Uh, first up, we have the Department of Human Services in support. We have Queen's Health System. Thank you. In support, um, we have Hawaii Pacific Health on Zoom. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair Mike Robinson, um, Vice President of Government Relations at Hawaii Pacific Health. I'll stand in our written testimony and, and note that this is a, a very uh, serious area of concern for um, hospital finances. Um, so we're really pleased um, that this um, resolution was introduced. There are 11 um, 340B health systems in our state, uh, both public and private, that rely on the savings that the 340B um, has provided. Um, I can share that at Hawaii Pacific Health alone, we estimate we, we lose about a million a month on these changes. And uh, we also recognize that there are at least 22 states across the country that have introduced legislation um, to essentially prevent um, manufacturers from uh, impl implementing the policies that they put in place. So um, we are looking forward to have this discussion. I know it's a complex issue, but it is something of great, great concern to um, um, Hawaii Pacific Health. Thank you. Thank you. We have a Healthcare Association of Hawaii. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll keep my commentary short. I really want to thank Mike um, and our other hospital partners who have spoken today. This is a national issue. This is a national push by national companies to try and restrict access to this program that is providing benefit to not only our safety net hospitals, but also community health centers. We are really hopeful that we can work with our state agencies to find a way to address this practice. We know that there is growing movement in many other states to pass similar language. Um, there are states that have passed bills banning this practice. And so we're very hopeful that with this resolution, we can continue that work and make sure that we're not um, being subjected to these harmful provisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Hawaii Primary Care Association in support. Uh, YNI Coast Comprehensive Health Center in support um, and an individual in support. We also have testimony from uh, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Pharma. In, oh, did you? Oh, okay. Uh, providing comments. Morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Members. William Gu on behalf of Pharma. <clears throat> we did submit uh, 
written testimony, albeit late. Um, we apologize for that. But we, we basically, uh, Pharma, you know, obviously is, is, is aware of the importance of the 340B program. But with respect to this resolution, some of the language um, it feels is somewhat inflammatory. So we have submitted some proposed amendments to try to address these issues, which I think would more fairly reflect what the current situation is. Uh, available to answer any questions if, if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's all the testimony we've received, members. Um, anybody in the room wishing to testify? Aloha, Angela Melody Young, testifying on behalf of CARES and Strong Support. So Congress created the 340B um, drug pricing program in 1992 to protect safety net hospitals from escalating drug prices by allowing them to purchase outpatient drugs at a discount from manufacturers. The Department of Health is urged to work with pharmaceutical companies um, to make sure companies uphold commitments to patient access to affordable pharmaceuticals by refraining from restrictions that limit and undermine the ability of 340B hospitals to serve patients and the communities. The federal offices are urged to monitor and address instances of pharmaceutical companies' actions um, that uh, restrict the access right, to the drugs and to take appropriate legislative um, and regulatory action to protect the integrity of the 340B program. So accessibility to medicines for underserved, disproportionate communities experiencing health and wealth disparities is a concern, right? Poverty, low-income communities experience adverse health outcomes. Um, they experience more uh, diverse social determinants of health in which they lack um, the equity to get um, medical care. And so um, this um, like basic explanation is that this resolution will help disproportionate hospitals, children's hospitals, critical access hospitals, and cancer hospitals. And um, this uh, 340B program is tailored to assist hospitals which provide services to low-income people um, to serve isolated rural communities. So as part of the government's effort to respond to the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID-19 public health emergency, HHS allowed flexibilities in um, the departmental programs, including this 340B program. Angela, do you uh, summarize and start wrapping up? Okay, yeah. We need to go to vote. Okay, okay. So... Um, all right, just read the program. And this resolution will improve healthcare access and medical equity. Okay, thank you. Any other members in the room or on Zoom wishing to testify on this resolution? Seeing none, members, any questions? Okay, um, I think we're gonna go right into decision-making. Um, quorum. I'm ready. Okay, thank you, Chair. <laughs> Okay, uh, so going into decision making, uh, first up, SCR 23 SD1. Um, this is for rule making for um, licensed dietitians. Uh, recommendation is to pass as is. Um, any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay, seeing none, Chair, for the vote, please. Chair's recommendation is to pass unamended SCR 23 SD1. Chair, Vice Chair, voting aye. Rep. Amato? Aye. Rep. Ilagan? Aye. Rep. Uh, Kobayashi, excused. Rep. Martin? Rep. Nishimoto? Aye. Rep. Garcia? Excuse. Your uh, 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 recommendation is adopted. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to SCR 34. Um, this is for the thyroid testing before certain medications are prescribed. Recommendation is to pass as is. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation is to pass SCR 34 unamended, noting the excused absences of Representatives Kobayashi and Garcia. Any no's? Any reservations? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, uh, members, SCR 64. Um, this is to address the ongoing fentanyl epidemic. Um, recommendation is to pass as is. Um, thank you to the Hawaii Island Fentanyl Task Force for noting the one typo. Um, I think um, in the interest of where we are in the legislative session, um, this typo doesn't impact the um, what we're asking the resolution to do. Um, so it's not a substantive change. So just to make sure this can move forward and hopefully um, pass more easily, um, we're just gonna move it as is. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, uh, Chair, for Chair's, the vote. Chair's recommendation is to pass SCR 64 unamended, noting the excused absences of Representatives Kobayashi and Garcia, Garcia any no's? Any reservations? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Uh, last resolution, SCR 81 SD1, this is about 
uh, our resolution about the 340B drug pricing program. Um, recommendation is to pass with amendments. Um, thank you to everybody who has raise concerns um, about this with us. Um, the amendments we're gonna make are on page two, uh, line 15, we're gonna strike, starting on line 15, we're gonna strike um, intentionally undermining the purpose of the 340B program. On page two, um, starting on line 20, this will now read, where is the restrictions impact instead of jeopardize? So these restrictions impact the ability of 340B hospitals and FQHCs to effectively serve their patients and can, we're gonna add the word can here, create unnecessary barriers to accessing affordable medications. And then finally on page three, um, the be it further resolve clause starting on page one, we are going to, oh, Sorry, page three, starting on line four, where after restrict access, we're going to add outlines in section 256B of title 42 of the United States Code um, that Pharma uh, would like to see referenced there. Uh, and those are all the amendments. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, seeing none, chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation is to pass SCR 81, SD1 with amendments, noting the excused absences of Representative Kobayashi and Representative Garcia. Any no's? Any reservations? Seeing none, chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay. Aye. Thank you, members. And I think chair wants to wrap up really quickly. I'm going to exercise my discretion because this is the very last hearing committee for one of our esteemed members. Um, he is the brother from another mother that I consider. Um, but I'm very um, uh, thankful for him. But I'm also thankful for all of you on this committee. We have worked hard and done a lot of good work. We will continue to do a lot of good work into conference. So with that, I will let Vice Chair adjourn the meeting. Oh, wait, uh, would Representative uh, to my right like to say anything? Chair. <laughs> okay. We're adjourned.